La cybersécurité, tout le monde en parle, tout le monde en a peur, et on avait décidé de vous en parler de façon un petit peu plus précise. C'est pour ça que nous avons sollicité la présence de Méni Barzilet. Hello, Méni. Hi. Alors, Méni Barzilet est un expert en cybersécurité de réputation mondiale. C'est l'ancien Chief Information Security Officer, ou RSSI en français, des forces de défense israéliennes. Donc il connaît un petit peu le sujet de la sécurité. Il a également travaillé dans le public, notamment à la banque à Poilly, à divers postes de responsabilité. Il est le cofondateur de Fortitou, de Cyber Security Professional Services, et de Fortitou Research Labs. Many conseille de nombreuses entreprises mondiales et des gouvernements dans leur stratégie de cybersécurité. Et on a voulu profiter de sa présence pour qu'il vous fasse profiter de ses conseils de haut niveau. Many, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, hi everybody, good morning. Do you hear me okay? The sound is okay? Perfect. I'm very excited to be here. So to be honest, this is my second time in uh, France. My first time was four days ago. I was here during the weekend. Um, I went to uh, a talk in another conference. And ever since I came here a week ago, I'm in love with Paris. This is the only place I've seen in, in France. Um, the food is amazing. The people are amazing. French people have so much style. I really love being here. Uh, I hope I have more um, opportunities to come here. I want to talk today about cybersecurity. We're going to talk about a lot of things. Um, we don't have a lot of time, and I have a lot of stories. Uh, I just want to better understand who are the people that sit around me. Um, so if you're in the IT business, please raise your hand. If you're an IT guy, if you're a technology guy, hands-on guy. If you are um, uh, into information security, please raise your hand, cybersecurity, information security. Okay, a lot of people here. Um, if, you're into, if you are an entrepreneur, if you have a startup, please raise your hand. Any entrepreneurs here? One, two, no entrepreneurs. Okay, three. Uh, if you are um, in the senior management of a company, please raise your hand, senior management. Okay, okay, perfect, perfect. Um, if you have an iPhone, please raise your hand. Anyone with an iPhone? Okay, anyone here with an Android-based phone, obviously? Yeah, a lot of people. Um, anyone here, and I'm truly sorry for asking that, with a Blackberry? <laughs> Windows phone? You, have, you two have Windows phones? Do you work for Microsoft? <laughs> no, it's by choice? Wow. Um, okay, if you have a Facebook account, please raise your hand. Anyone here with a Facebook account? Okay, if you have more than one Facebook account, please raise your hand. Interesting, why do you have more than one face? No, never mind, we don't want to know. <laughs> okay, Twitter, anyone with Twitter? Okay, LinkedIn. Have you ever bought something from eBay? Amazon. AliExpress. Deal Extreme. Do you use Tinder? <laughs> no? Liars. <laughs> okay, okay. Anyone here with Bitcoins? Okay, interesting. Okay, um, last question for now. If you had to choose between spending three days in a deserted island alone, um, without your smartphone or without your toothbrush, um, obviously the island has Wi-Fi and there is a, you can charge your phone. You had to spend Three days, you had to spend three days. Hey, ah. You had to spend three, three days without your smartphone or without your toothbrush. Uh, this question is not for the people with the Windows phone, I'm sorry. <laughs> for everyone else, who would take his, smart, his uh, toothbrush with him? Who would take his smartphone? Yeah. So those people are the truth tellers and everyone else are lying. It is clear. Okay, so my name is Manny Basilai. I'm not going to talk about myself because you already heard about me. Um, I want to talk to you about cybersecurity. So imagine this. 
You want to go on vacation. You've planned this vacation for a long time. You are very excited with this vacation. Uh, you decided to go to uh, uh, a nice, uh, very warm uh, place. You go on the plane. You take off your luggage and you reach to this hotel, which is a very, very beautiful place. Obviously, not a warm place. It's a cold place. Nevertheless, you want to go there. And when you go and you, when you decide to go into your room, you discover that a group of hackers actually took control over uh, the hotel and nobody can enter the rooms. Um, this, is, this actually happened to this hotel. A group of hackers took control over the system that opens, uh, that creates new cards to open and close the doors. And everyone that had to go had to get a card couldn't go into their hotel room. And because of that incident, the hotel people decided that they are going to go back into regular doors. Now, I'm sure this made the hackers very happy, right? Um, guys, the sounds of the presentation should be up all the time, right? So the presentation, the sound from the presentation should be up all the time. Yeah? So let me see if it works. Yeah? So this is the hackers obviously are very happy with the fact that their impact, this cyber attack, um, created such an impact that those people decided to remove technology and go back to old tech. It seems like cyber attacks influence every aspect of our lives, from our personal life to business life to government level, state level, world economy, world uh, uh, politics. Everything is affected by cybersecurity recently. And we hear about that all the time. And when we hear about the companies that were hacked in the past few years, we see those amazing, amazingly big companies, very smart companies, with smart people. Those companies got hacked. And those companies invest a lot of money in cybersecurity. They have the best people. They have the best technologies. They do everything right. And yet, those companies got hacked. And we have to ask ourselves, what do we do differently? If they got hacked, that means that can we get hacked? Is there anything that we can do in order to prevent the next hack? And when we talk about cybersecurity, we understand that the future is not bright. Someone once said that it's difficult to make predictions, right? Especially about the future. We don't have the ability to read the future. I assume that not most of us. Nevertheless, when we talk about the future of cybersecurity, you know something? We already know that we have a problem. We already know that in 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, more companies are going to be hacked. Big companies, huge companies that have the best people, that use the best technologies, that have they do everything right, and then those companies are going to be hacked. To some extent, the world of cybersecurity is failing. Now, there is a way to be secure in this very complex world. We just need to figure out how. And the reason that we know that the world, that we have a problem, and the world is going to a very difficult place is a basic rule. Now, everybody here in this room knows this rule. This is a basic rule. Nevertheless, this rule is the engine of the cybersecurity industry. This rule is the reason that in the years to come, more companies are going to be hacked. And this rule says that change always equals new opportunities plus new threats. This rule says that innovation is a two-sided coin. Every new technology creates new problems. And if we believe that the world is going to be more dependent on technologies, smart cars, smart houses, smart cities, biotech, robots, and other things as well. We know that each and every one of those technologies is going to create amazing new problems, and we're going to talk about those problems a little bit. So the challenge, the challenge that we have is how do we stay one step ahead of the hackers? When we ask this guy, the professional hockey player, where do you go when you want to catch the puck, right? He always says, I'm going to the place where I think the puck is going and not to the place where the puck is right now. And that's the way we have to manage our risks. We have to constantly ask, where is the puck going to be? But again, we don't have the ability to read the future. Well, sorry. Oh, yeah. But we know that the world of cybersecurity became a very complex place and a very dangerous place. 
And the reason for that is that hackers became very sophisticated. And the world, the crime market world, have become very mature. So we moved. In the past, we had those kind of attacks. Hackers tried to, take, to attack us all. They send us emails. They send us links. They send us viruses. Some of us click them. Those were random attacks, much like a fisherman tries to attack a fish, right? In that case, the fisherman is the hacker. The fish are the potential victims. And the attack tool is a fishing rod. Can a fisherman control which fish will bite the bait? No, that used to be the case. We all got this link and some of us clicked. We were the fish that, that, that bite the bait. But we moved and we know that. We moved to those kind of attacks. Where we have targeted attacks. Where the fishermen decide on one fish, a bank in Paris somewhere. They don't care about other banks. The hacker will spend 12 months in attacking just that bank, they will learn who are the employees of that bank, what are their names, who are the friends, what kind of technologies are being used in this bank. They will develop attack tools specifically for that bank. And they will attack this bank step by step. And after a year of work, they expect to take $100 million back. The hackers will invest half a million dollars of their own money in attacking this bank. And they expect to take at least $100 million back. Well, you know something very interesting? This is the way a cyber attack unit in the military works. If you go into the army, to, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, French army, and you go to one of the secret places in, you have in the army, where you have SIGINT unit, signal intelligence unit, those units that attack other countries in the cyberspace, you will see that this is how they work. They choose one victim. They spend all the time and resources needed in order to attack it. And suddenly, the organized crime works as if they were cyber uh, military cyber attack unit. Why? Because today, the profits are high. You can make a lot of money by doing that, but not just money. You can control who will be the president of the United States, maybe. You can control the economy in some states. Cyber attacks have a lot of value in them. But we see more than that. We see crime startups. Different people, each and every one of them is an expert in different aspects of crime. And they work together in order to execute a business plan. Now, their business plan is illegal, but it is a business plan. They have a CEO, they have a CTO, they have uh, timelines, they have salaries, they will, you will get a bonus if you did a good job. This is a crime startup. Well, as you can expect, there is one difference. The termination process, getting fired from a crime startup is a little different from getting fired from a regular startup. But I will give you an example for a crime startup. Now, everybody here knows this example, I assume. If not everyone, as most, as a, then most of the people here knows this example. Nevertheless, I want you to stop thinking about this example as a computer virus, and I want you to start thinking about it as a business. Ransomware. Have you heard the phrase ransomware? Right, everybody, right? Ransomware. People think about ransomware as a computer virus, but it is not. It is a startup company. So you have amazing people, developer, created a system that knows how to move from one computer to another, support different operating systems, know how to encrypt files in a smart way, manage the encryption keys in a different server. You have monetized uh, a system so you can pay and you get things back. In some of those viruses, you have customer support. You have a phone number that you will call them, and someone on the other side will help you to buy the bitcoins and pay the criminals. In some of those viruses, you have secure purchase. That means that if you pay the criminals through the ransomware, they gave you the key, you try to open the files and it didn't work, they will give you your money back. This is a business. If this was legal, those guys that created this virus would get a lot of people investing in them. Even policemen in the United States paid criminals in order to open the files in their own computers. This is a super effective way today to make money. And successful ransomware companies make tens of millions of dollars a year. There is no surprise that this became one of the most successful business structure in the cybercrime industry. Business. They behave like a business. They have strategies. They have smart people. They hire best people. But we see more than that. We have the dark net. If you ever visited the dark net, please raise your hand. 
Interesting. Why? <laughs> so many people. Very interesting. Okay. Um, so the dark net. This is a place on the internet where the level of anonymity is higher, right? You can do, there, you can do things there in an anonymous way. And there are those marketplaces on the dark net where you can buy and sell whatever you want. Now, there is a saying. Listen carefully. There is a saying. Only when a man puts a mask over his face, his true face is being revealed. The moment we've created a place where you can buy and sell whatever you want in an anonymous way, we created a place where the worst things the human mind could create are there. Worst, terrible, terrible things. Like pedophiles and killing people is easy compared to the things you can find there. Terrible, terrible things. But the Darknet also created, uh, uh, um, took the world of cybercrime one step forward. Now we have crime as a service. Now you can hire hackers, you can sell credit cards, you can hire someone who will do money laundering for you. You can do whatever you want on the dark uh, net. And, and this is amazing, because now you don't have to be a very successful hacker in order to hack someone. You just go on the uh, dark net, you hire the person you want, you ask him to hack someone, and you get everything from there. And we have those amazing websites, like this one, that will allow you to buy stolen PayPal accounts. You can see, the, the, the information about the PayPal account, how much money there is in this account, how much money they are looking for, uh, to get for it. We have websites like this one that will allow you to buy fake um, uh, driver license for the United States. This is another one that will allow you to buy fake UK passports if you need one. Talk to me later. There is, uh, no, just kidding. There is a, um, this website that will allow you to buy fake bills. If you want to buy a fake bill, they will sell it to you. The price of a fake bill is 40% of its value. That means that if you want to buy 100 euros, you will pay 40 euros for this fake bill. And so on and so forth. And if you want to know the prices, so here are the prices. How much would you pay for a stolen credit card on the dark net? Twin dollar and a half to three dollars. Five dollars, you're paying too much. How much would you pay for someone's identity? Yeah, very good. This is disturbing that you know that. Between dollar and a half to three dollars. <laughs> How much would you pay for someone's entire digital life? His credit card, his email, everything they have, his digital life as a package? You know, <laughs> exactly. Between five dollars and twenty dollars. How much would you pay for someone's username and uh, um, uh, password for his uh, e-banking account? Between $50 and $1,000. It depends on the bank and how much money does this person have um, in his bank and so on and so forth. So we see that the world of crime actually reached this amazing level of maturity. But someone, something else happens. And we all feel that, that this happened. But it's very important to see that in the past few years, the extent to which this thing happened actually increased dramatically. So the damage created by cyber attacks is no longer limited to the cyberspace. I will say that again. The damage created by cyber attacks is no longer limited to the cyberspace. This is supposed to be clear for everyone. We see that, right? It happened in Germany just recently where hackers succeeded in breaking down machines with a cyber attack. So physical machines got broken because of a cyber attack. And this is a very famous incident. Are you familiar with this incident? Raise your hand. Some people are. Amazing. So this is a Jeep by Chrysler. And inside this Jeep, we have a reporter for Wired. Now, two hackers approach him. One's name is Charlie. The other's name is Chris. And they tell him, you know, we can take control over your car. He tells them, let's, let's make an experiment. Go home. Go to your living room. I will send a cameraman with you. I will drive on the highway. Show me what you can do to my car. The only thing that I ask you is, please remember, this is not one of your uh, computer games. This is real life. Like, on the other side of the computer sits a man in a car. I'm on the highway. Please don't risk my life. So they do that. They go home. He goes on the highway. They show him what they can do. They actually didn't really get the part of this is a real man and real car. And they did some stupid things. All right, all the... Something just turned on, all the fans and AC and stuff. I didn't do that. The trick started small. Oh my god. There's a picture of Charlie and Chris in 
tracksuits that just appeared on the dashboard. But as I drove down the interstate, things started getting unpleasant and very loud. Perfect. I can't turn it down. So as you can see, the music is blasting, and I can't see anything because of the windshield wiper fluid. They're not nice. Okay, do it. Do it. Kill the engine. So we're killing the engine right now. It says park Now the car stops in the hi on the highway, and he's in the car. He's like really stressed. He tells them, guy, he calls them, he tells them, guys, come on. <laughs> What, what did I tell you? Like, I'm on the highway. If someone from behind me talks on his phone and not, that wouldn't notice for a second, we will both be killed. They laugh like they, uh, they, they didn't really understand the extent of what they're going to do. And they tell him the only way to take control over your car back is to do it Microsoft Windows style, which is exactly restart it. So he turned it off, turn it off, turn it on, and take control over his car. And then he reaches a parking lot, right? And in the parking lot, they show him that they were actually nice. Because in the parking lot, that take control over his steering wheel, his gas pedal, and the brakes. Why do they have the ability to do that? You know, a lot of car manufacturers today are very happy with the fact that their car knows how to park itself. What does it mean? It means that the computer controls the steering wheel, the gas pedal, and the brakes. That means that if I control this computer, I control everything. This is a real car, and this is not the only car that got hacked. The damage created by cyber attacks is no longer limited to the cyberspace, and this is a problem that's going to be even bigger in the years to come. Why? Because we're going to connect a lot of new devices to the internet. Hackers that can take down planes, that can make ships sink, that can make trains clash, that can kill people by hacking the pacemaker and insulin pump. This is the future that we're going into. But there is another thing I want you to understand. The world of hacking is also a world very innovative and advanced. Many people, when they think about hacker, imagine hacker in your mind. Why? When you think about the hacker, what do you imagine? So most people, when they think about hackers, they think about those people that sit in dark rooms. They hear dark metal music. They, have, uh, uh, they write this complex code nobody can understand. They drink beer. They eat pizza. They never take a shower. And, and, and this is interesting because those are not the hackers today. Because the art of hacking has changed. Hacking today is not writing this super complex code that nobody can understand. For many cases, hacking is using simple attack tools. So this is an attack tool. And this is an attack tool. And this is an attack tool. Those are graphical attack tools. Very simple to use. You just write the data inside, you press a button, everything is automatic. Becoming a hacker today is much easier. And if you don't know where to find those systems, don't worry. You can just download from the internet something called, and all the information security guys here should know that, right? We know that. Kali Linux, right? Kali Linux is an operating system, graphical operating system, very similar to Windows. The major difference is that Kali Linux is an operating system for hackers, right? It comes with hundreds of attack tools inside. Simple to use. They are organized by categories. Password attack uh, uh, tools, uh, web attack tools, mobile attack tools, and so on and so forth. Becoming a hacker today is much easier. And if you don't know, um, and uh, Kali Linux is, is free on the internet. You just go on Google, you write Kali Linux, you get into this website, which is a legitimate website. You press on the link that you want, Kali Linux will be downloaded to your computer. Simple, this is a very quick and simple um, uh, uh, process. And if you don't know what to do next, you don't know how to install Kali Linux, you don't know how to use the tool, don't worry. YouTube is full of tutorials. For beginners, for advanced, for everything. So if you're a teenager and you have those technological uh, instincts, you can sit at home and become a super hacker. And you don't need anyone else. And obviously, there are physical attack tools. Um, I'll give you just one example. Uh, this one, this is, it looks like electricity plug, but if you notice, there's something strange in this picture. 
What's strange in this picture? Yeah, that one of the cables is actually network and not electricity, right? It looks like electricity plug, but actually one of the uh, cables is network cable. And this is a computer that you put inside a company, you go into this company, you connect this computer, everybody thinks that this is just an electricity plug, so nobody notices it. But this is actually a full computer. You can put viruses inside or whatever you want inside, and you control it wirelessly. And this is a great way to leave a computer inside a company without anyone noticing it. Um, this, this, um, this looks like this is a charging system, a uh, mobile charge, charging system. Uh, you connect your iPhone or your Android phone to that, and in half a second, your phone is completely owned by the people who created the system. This is a, uh, looks like a printer, and it is a printer. This is, no, just kidding. This, is, this looks like a printer, and this is actually a um, cellular antenna. So you put that inside the company, everybody thinks it's a printer, but because this is the strongest cellular antenna around, all our phones will be linked to this antenna. And from that moment on, you can start doing whatever you want. You can start attacking those phones. And the problem is this one, right? You recognize this. This is our brain. Most of us have one, right? We know that. The problem is that our brain is the device in charge of identifying problems and taking the actions needed in order to mitigate them. If there was a lion here, our brain will tell us, watch out, there's a lion here, we will all run. If there was fire here, our brain will tell us, amazing, this is fire, right? But right now, while we're sitting here, in this moment, there are many people around the world who are trying to attack friends. There are many, many cyber attacks units in many different armies around the world who are trying to attack companies and government entities in France, right now. Right now, the companies that we came from, are, someone is trying to hack them. This is not a secret, right? We know that. This is, I'm not, I'm not, I hope I'm not telling you anything new. But our brain is not willing to accept that. It sounds like it doesn't really happen. It sounds like science fiction. Why? Why? Why would a lion sound like a real threat, but the cyber attack doesn't sound like a real threat? The problem is that our brain knows only how to deal with threats that can be identified through our senses. If we can see that, smell that, taste it, touch it, or hear that, we know how to deal with that. But cyber attacks is something that we need to think about. This is not something that actually we can perceive. So it feels like it's not really happening. And even if I will succeed for a second to convince people that this is a real problem, the moment we will leave and go to drink coffee, we will forget about it. If we had a lion here, nobody forget about it, even if we will have coffee. This is a big challenge for cybersecurity guys, right? The cybersecurity guys here know. How do you convince the CEO, the board of directors, that this is a real problem, not something imaginary? But this is a great opportunity if you are the hacker, right? France is also a country that attacks other countries on the cyberspace. So that works in favor of France. When, uh, when people hire my company, and we're doing cybersecurity consulting, right? when people hire us to do penetration testing to their companies, and when we succeed, everybody's always surprised. When someone gets hacked, they're always surprised. Why? Because our brain is not willing to make us think that this is a real threat and it will not create the same sense of urgency. I want to show you a short video. Now in this video we have a reporter and he approaches a hacker and she's amazing, I'm in love with her. Um, he tells her, show me what you can do um, uh, by manipulating people's brain. And she tells him, I'm going to do a social engineering attack. Are you familiar with the concept of social engineering? Social engineering, the clever manipulation of the natural human tendency to trust. We love to trust each other, right? And this is why it's very easy to exploit that trust. So this hacker, she tells him, I'm going to do social engineering. That means I'm going to attack someone without using any technical tools. I'm going to call your mobile service provider. And I'm going to try to make them give me your personal email address. And he tells her, you know what? Go. I don't think you are able to do that. She tells him, let's try. Who are you going to call? Maybe I'll call your cell phone provider okay. and see if I can get them to give me your email address. I, I bet they're good. I bet they have my back. <laughs> but yeah, go, go for it. I'm going to spoof from your number, so it's going to look like it's calling from you. OK. Hi. I'm actually, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me OK? I, my baby. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> my <laughs> my husband's like, we're about to apply for a loan and we just had a baby and he's like, get this done by today. So I'm so sorry, I can't I, um, call you back. <laughs> I'm trying to log into our account for uses information and I can't remember what email address we use to log the account. The baby's crying and um, can, can you help me? Awesome. In just 30 seconds, Jessica gets my personal email address. Um, now, if I need now the to... video go on and it go on. I don't want to show you the entire video because we don't have a lot of time. But trust me, she gets everything. She got the support people to reset his password. She got full control over his mobile account. Now, you you saw what she did there, right? She went on YouTube, she put a video of a crying baby, and she called a person from the support team. Now, in our mind, a mother and a crying baby equals trust. When we think about trust, we think about a mother and a crying baby. This is amazing. So it seems like science fiction that someone with a crying baby will call us to try to attack us. And if you think that attacking someone's mobile uh, uh, service provider is not a big deal, remember that for many people, the mobile is their second factor of authentication. You gather the SMS, the text, the text message, and everything. If I can get the company to send me a new SIM with your phone number, I can use it in order to use two-factor authentication for your account. So this is a big issue. We love to trust each other. And when we don't trust people, we feel not comfortable with that. So sometimes we behave as if we trust someone, even if we don't trust them. Social engineering is one of the most effective cyber attacks um, in the past few years. And in every, almost every big attack that was published in the newspaper, there was a, some, uh, some point that someone from the company opened the doors for the hackers. There was someone who clicked, someone who sent information. Social engineering is a very effective way to go about it. Now, I want to talk to you about what can we do. Obviously, it was a very sad presentation up until that point. Everything is bad. The world is going to hell. Um, everything is hackable. We can be all hacked. So I want to talk about how can we be secure today. So our traditional cybersecurity approach um, had a question. People like me, cybersecurity guys, we ask ourselves a question. And that was a very important question. Upon this question, we've built the entire cybersecurity industry as we used to know it. And this question was, will someone be able to hack us? Sadly enough, some companies are still asking this question. Will someone be able to hack us? Obviously, we wanted the answer to be no. So what did we do? We implemented tools like firewalls, right? To keep the bad guys outside and the good guys inside. And then we implemented more firewalls to keep all the users on one side and all the servers on the other side. And then we implemented more firewalls and more firewalls and we were so happy with ourselves. We understand today that this is not enough. Why? We talk about the asymmetry of attack. Being a hacker is much easier than being the security guy. We feel that. If you're a hacker, you need to succeed one time. If you're a security guy, you have to succeed all the time. If you're a hacker, you can attack one point. If you're a security guy, you have to secure everything. Hacking has no rules. You can do whatever you want. With security, there are so many rules. And if you will do something you're not allowed to do, someone might fire you, or even worse, put you in jail. There are many different hackers, one security team. And for many other reasons today, security is like trying to guard this balloon with our bare hands. Well, the hackers has a pin. Even between our fingers, they can blow up this balloon. That leads us to the number one rule of this presentation. Everything is hackable. We have to accept that everything is hackable. We have to truly accept that everything is hackable. And when we do, we are doing the first and most important step towards creating an effective cybersecurity strategy. It is clear that this question is not enough. We need a new question that will lead to a new way of thinking, that will allow us to develop a new way of cyber strategy, a new method of cyber strategy. But this new question that we require to ask today requires a lot of courage. Not a lot of people have the courage to ask this question. Not a lot of companies, not a lot of CEOs, not a lot of board of directors have the courage to ask this question. Nevertheless, we have to ask this question now. What will happen when we get hacked? What do we do the moment we get hacked? We have to be prepared. We have to have very a very good uh, plan uh, 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 on the table. And when we ask this question, it leads us to another very important rule. 
prevention is not enough. We need to do more than prevention. We need to rebalance between prevention and detection. If we uh, have the ability to devise a detection strategy, which is a weird concept, right? We know how to do prevention strategy, but what's detection strategy? Nevertheless, if we will have the ability to create a detection strategy, we will discover something very interesting. With detection, there is reverse asymmetry. It's easier for us and harder, harder for the hacker. Some of you know it's very hard to hack an organization without leaving any trace. Suddenly, we think, in this war, we know how to win. But in the past few years, company, uh, companies got too excited about detection systems. And we reached this point where we have too much data. And we don't know what to do with it, right? So um, it seems like we failed with the detection strategy. Nevertheless, security automation might be the solution. There are amazing companies today, amazing companies today, that knows how to take this huge amount of information and find only the right and most important things inside it. But more than prevention doesn't necessarily mean detection. We have to talk about multidimensional cyber strategy today, where we invest in prevention and detection, but in other things as well, like cyber intelligence. Many times, the only way companies discover that they were hacked, the only way companies discover that they were hacked is by finding someone on the darknet who tries to sell their, their information. We have to be very good with incident response, deception, and other things as well. Amazing startup companies. If you're a big company, if you're an enterprise, don't be afraid to work with startup companies. This is very important. This helps the, the entire industry. This helps the entire ecosystem, but it also helps you. Obviously, for every company, we have to devise their specific cyber strategy based on all their, their specific problems. I want to talk about the last thing. Let me just make sure that we have the time. Perfect. We have the time. I want to talk about um, the future a little bit. I want to talk about the future a little bit, and uh, this will be the last part of my presentation. We are about to connect billions of new devices to the internet, right? Billions of new devices. And, and, and we already know that this, the current internet is a very problematic place. We have a lot of criminals. We have a lot of cyber war going on. We have so many things. And we are yet to connecting to the same internet billions of new devices. But it seems like this allows us to think big, because the dream big, because we're making things smart. Shoes become smart shoes, chairs become smart chairs, houses become smart houses, everything becomes smart. And it makes humanity do amazing things like this one um, that will allow you to check if you still need to buy eggs or not, which is not that smart to me, I don't know. This is a smart hairbrush that will allow you to check if you brush your hair right. I, people, I don't know. This is a smart toothbrush that will tell you if you brush your teeth correctly. Um, this is a smart condom that will tell you um, how bad you are with, I don't know. So it seems like everything is becoming smart. What does that mean? It means that there are many new things that can be attacked, many new ways to attack them, and many new reasons to attack them. So crime will have more incentive. And those devices are not going to be secure. Those devices are not, we already know that this is a fight that we lost in. Why? Because companies are trying to make those devices very cheap. So they have small CPU. They don't have space. They take not a lot of electricity. And cybersecurity required a lot of those things. So it's not cost effective. I want to talk about an example for a problem that we will see in the world of Internet of Things. So we have three problems. I'm going to talk about probably one because we don't have a lot of time. We are moving from always off to always on. That means that to now, if I want to take a picture, I have to take my phone, turn on the sensor that calls camera, click a button, and then I take a picture. Tomorrow, if I want to stop taking a picture, I need to do something. We're moving to an always-on world. And even though this is a small change, this will have dramatic effect on humankind. Privacy mining. Our privacy will be, uh, 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 will be used more to make more uh, profits, right? So companies like Facebook, and I'm not saying that in a bad way. This is a structure of the internet. We have to understand that. Again, I'm not saying that in a bad way. This is Facebook. 
Facebook knows how to transform privacy. There are a big machine that knows how if you put privacy on one hand, one side, you get profit on the other side. That transforms privacy into profit, right? So privacy mining will be a big issue in the years to come because there will be more ways to collect information about us. Problem number two, um, this is me on TV. So I was asked, uh, I, I go on TV uh, in Israel a lot of times just to show you that the level of TV in Israel is not very high. Um, and they asked me to talk about something co uh, that re relates to uh, Amazon Echo. Are you familiar with the Amazon Echo? If you are, please raise your hand. Okay, I will show you a picture if you're not familiar with Amazon Echo. <clears throat> Amazon Echo is uh, Amazon's self-helper. You put a device in your uh, room and you can talk to it. Alexa, please wake me up tomorrow at 5. Alexa, uh, how, much, um, um, how much, I don't know, an elephant weight, whatever. You can ask it questions and Alexa will answer. So they wanted me to talk about Alexa. There was a, 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 an incident where someone got killed and the police wanted the recording from Alexa. So here it's me, I'm talking blah, 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 trying to make people think I know what I'm talking about, I don't know what I'm talking about. And once in a while I'm saying Alexa, because I'm talking about this device. And this is the device. And after the interview, people called me <clears throat> and they told me that every time I said Alexa on TV, the device went on in their houses. Wow! This is amazing. I can sit on TV and control devices on people's houses. I was super excited by that fact. And immediately I started thinking, what is the most terrible thing I can do on TV that will abuse those people that will watch me and have Alexa? So my, thought, my first uh, idea was to make Alexa play the heaviest metal, the, the most heaviest heavy metal song I can find. So Alexa, please play something like Behemoth uh, uh, song. So this was a song. <laughs> This is a song, don't worry. But I was, I was really afraid that I would cause a heart attack for someone with this song. So uh, I decided not to do that. My second idea was to make Alexa uh, order a wedding dress from Amazon. I thought this will be super funny. Like this guy is dating this girl for three weeks, suddenly you get a wedding dress home. I thought that would be hilarious, but then I thought it might cause a, a heart attack for this guy. Um, I decided not to do that. But as I was thinking about it more and more, there is a real problem there. Because there is no way to control which person talks to Alexa. So even if you have a very secure place, like an office, with uh, very secure walls, very secure alarm system, very, very, the most secure place in the world, but you connect Alexa to the network, people can, send, can stand outside the window and talk to this device and ask this device to do things. And this breaks the entire physical security model that we had up until recently. Connecting sensors to sensitive networks is a real problem today. And the thing is, we don't have a solution for that. Wi-Fi networks have the same problem, right? The moment you created Wi-Fi networks, they go outside the walls of the room. So what did we do? We encrypted them. So we don't care if people see them because they are encrypted. You cannot encrypt the discussion between a person and Alexa. You can buy this very small room and put Alexa inside, which is a soundproof room, and only talk to it when you're inside, but that's stupid, right? And, and you can try to use voice identification, but voice identification systems are not very sophisticated today. And there are already companies that create uh, human synthesizing systems that will allow you to sound like anyone else. So this is a problem with no solution. I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk, we have probably two minutes. How much time do we have? Okay, we have uh, six minutes, yeah? Six minutes, I will take 65. Um, no, just kidding. <laughs> I, want to talk about, uh, I want to talk about that. And we'll finish with that. The Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is amazing, but the Internet of Things is not just one thing. It's actually a family of things, right? Inside the Internet of Things, we have, again, smart houses, smart cities, wearable, uh, driverless cars, heavy smart machinery, biotech, robots, and other things. If you remember correctly, we said that innovation is a two-sided coin. Every new technology creates new problems. Each and every one of those trends is going to create amazing problems. We could have had a long talk about each and every one of them. I just want to talk about driverless, uh, driverless cars for a second, and we will finish with that. Driverless cars are amazing. Think about that. You, you know who loves driverless cars? Parents to young kids. If you have young kids, 
they love that. Why? Because they think that if, they, if the kids make too much noise and they want to send the kids to their grandparents, they can just put them in the car, close the door, and that's that. They get rid of the kids in two seconds. They love it. What parents don't take, what the parents don't take into consideration is what the grandparents want to send the kids back. It's just the same process, right? You sit in the car, the car identifies that there is a traffic jam ahead, and we're not going to be there for the first meeting. So the car tells the schedule, listen, we're not going to be there for the first meeting. The schedule check our position in the company, and the title of the, of the meeting decides that we are too important and postpone the first meeting, notifies all the other participants. Now this guy have a smart alarm clock, and the alarm clock knows that if the first meeting got postponed, it's better to wake you up one hour later. Things talk to things in order to make our lives better. And obviously, we expect the world to be much more secure, much more safe with driverless cars. But how do driverless cars look from the eyes of the hackers? Scenario number one. You're sleeping in the car. There aren't a lot of things to do besides sleeping in the car. The GPS is set to take you home. Someone hacks your car and changes just one small thing, which is the destination. You wake up in your car, you feel that you slept too much. Do you look out the window, you see you're, that you're in a dark place, you have no clue where you are. And from the other window, you see that two people actually waiting for you to wake up with guns because they kidnapped you the same way that they order pizza. So for the sake of drama, I edit this slide, watch carefully. It created the drama, it was with a big gong. Can you turn the volume of the computer on a little bit? Because it was, I'll show you the gong again. Yeah, let's see. Perfect. Yeah, John, yeah. Never mind. I know it's stupid, sorry. Scenario number two. You're sitting in a car, you're watching TV. Everything is automatic, right? And suddenly, even though you didn't touch it, the radio turns on. And from the radio, you hear this mechanical, weird voice saying something strange like, Hello, dear sir. It is a nice day today, and we hope you are enjoying your ride. Please notice that we have taken full control over your car. Don't worry. We mean you no harm. You are kindly requested to wire transfer 12 bitcoins to our account in the next 10 minutes. Otherwise, we will sadly have to kill you. Have a nice day. And thank you for your cooperation. You sit in a car, the car moves very, very fast. You might not even have a steering wheel. You know that in two minutes you're about to reach a bridge. What do you do? This is a new type of ransomware, but now, instead of hijacking our files, they will hijack us. And if you think that this is science fiction and can never happen, I just want to tell you that technically speaking, this can happen today. So where do we go from here? Um, it's very important to stay curious and to ask a lot of questions. Um, the world is changing very fast, and the way to cope with it is to work together and always share information. This is why those conferences are very, very important. But, the thing that is important is not just what happened here, it's what happened after we leave here. People talk to each other, exchange business cards. This is the way to, to create an ecosystem. This is the way to create a community. This is the way to be, more, uh, to be more secure. Hackers are very good in working together. We have to be much, much better. Um, security is not just a problem of the technological people, it's a business problem. Board of directors and CEOs should see, should have some examples of how hacking look like. One, listen to me carefully, one of the most effective ways for hackers, for, sorry, for uh, board of directors and senior management people to understand the problem is to see hacking demonstration. Only when I show people how easy it is to hack someone's phone or how easy, easy it is to hack someone's computer, then they understand. Security by design is still the best way to go about it. You have to think about security from the first step of every problem. Don't get too excited with those cyber problems. Remember that the core basic elements of cybersecurity are still the most important thing. Patch management, network segregation, firewall rules, implementation of IDSs and IPSs, those basic things are still very, very important. Physical security and digital security is not, are not two separate things. We have to have an holistic view because this car is based on computers. That means that this asset is a dual asset. The same car exists both in the physical world and in the digital world. That means that if I want to attack it, I can do it from both worlds. We have to have the ability to think like hackers. Don't be afraid to think like a hacker. We have to have the ability to ask the difficult questions of our times. And remember that trust is something that we can only create together. We have to work together in order to make sure the world is becoming a safer place. I want to show you a 10 seconds video about using technology in a wise, in a wise sense, and this will be the end of my presentation. 
Emma. Huh? Emma. 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 Guys, thank you so much. I have a lot of fun being here. Thank you. If you want to talk, this is my details. Feel free to contact me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Manny, for having scared to death each and every one of us. <laughs> thank you. No, oh, you're welcome. Uh, I would make a, s a short survey. Qui a, été, euh, a subi une prise de conscience importante de l'urgence d'agir suite à la présentation de Manny Ouch Qui s'en fout I have no clue what you're asking. Okay, I thank you. I, I, I hope was it wasn't asking, a bad thing. Who was scared? Who by cybersecurity about what you told us? That said, 10 to 15 persons. Who, who knew what, what it no, was? No, who was scared by it? Ah, scared by yes. it. Yes. Okay. Uh, who don't care? And well, a, a few raising hands. So and all other this is, uh, didn't understand the question. No. <laughs> okay. So what do you suggest to those guys who are indifferent on not tr thinking so much to act to do something? Yeah. Well, again, as I said, this is a big problem. People don't care. Many of the problems that we see today are the source of which is the fact that people don't care. They're not, they feel that um, they will invest more in making the world a happier place and more, uh, um, um, create more technology to do things, but they don't care. They're not excited about the problems that those technologies bring. And people only care after they get hacked. So most companies develop their um, respond plan after they got hacked for the first time, if they survived this hack. We have to have the ability to understand that this is a real uh, problem. But the fact that people don't care or, the, or don't um, get excited about cyber attacks <laughs> is, um, is, uh, is, one, is uh, some of the problem. It, it's a fake camera. Yeah. Yeah. It's a fake camera. It was a fake movement. <laughs> so <it's okay. laughs> uh, what do you think about uh, prevention tests, intrusion tests? Even uh, yeah. ruled by the company itself, just to yeah. pinpoint to their employee that the, the yeah. danger is real. Yeah. I think penetration testing is one of the most effective tools today in order to make sure that the company is right. You, you hire companies, cybersecurity companies like us, there are probably many, many people here that do that. Um, you ask them to hack your, your organization and give you a whole report about what went wrong and what could be prevented. This is a super effective way. Number one, because it allows you to find problems, real problems that hackers will exploit. Number two, that it shows you that it can happen. Right? Um, it seems like it can't happen until the moment someone shows you that it can happen. Just one thing about penetration testing, if you're doing that, remember, don't invest just um, uh, when you do the report in fixing the problems. Also try to understand why didn't the detection system, the Siemens SOC or whatever you have, the detection system didn't discover those companies, the, those hackers that the company um, uh, hired. Because here you have real hackers attacking your company and yet you didn't know about it until you got the report. So maybe uh, people are too shy to ask questions. But you will be there all the day long. Yeah, I'm in, here. In the Inopolis uh, yeah, I'm not sure village. if all day, but I'm here. I have flight today okay. to Israel. Il nous reste à remercier chaleureusement Meni. Thank you so much. Uh,